If you're passionate about Basset Hounds, this podcast is for you. This is Wobegon, the Basset Hound Podcast. I'm your host, Don Bullock. Hi everyone, I'm Don. One of my biggest passions is Basset Hounds. We've had a Basset Hound as part of our family for over 45 years. Our Bassets are our children. This is episode two of Wobegon, the Basset Hound podcast. In this episode, I'll tell the story of our Lucy, the difference between European and American Bassets, a newly discovered inherited disease in Bassets, and more. For those of you listening to the audio version of Wobegon, the Basset Hound podcast, the show notes, including photos for this episode, can be found under podcasts on our Wobegon Bassets Dot com website. In the last episode, I told the story of our first dog, Ruffy, and our very first Basset Hound, Maggie. This time, it's Lucy's turn. The story of Lucy is somewhat tragic, and it's one that's far too common, so it needs to be shared. Pam and I were thrilled at having dogs in our lives. Since both Pam and I were elementary school teachers, we had made the decision not to have children because we had so many at work and we didn't want to come home to more. As a result, our dogs were and still are our children. One day after making that decision and moving into a newer home, we were in a shopping mall fairly close to home. Yes, we made the mistake of going through the pet store. They had the cutest Basset Hound puppy in one of the enclosures. You have to understand, this was long before any media coverage on puppy mills or issues with pet store dogs. Besides, the puppy was so cute. At the time, we thought that buying a puppy with AKC papers meant the puppy was going to be a good example of the breed. Since Maggie had had such a poor temperament, that was important to us. Needless to say, we went home with our very first Basset Hound puppy that we named Lucy. Since Lucy came with AKC registration papers, we did register her. At the time, we mistook AKC papers for quality. In reality, they were meaningless, as you'll soon see. The AKC registration application said to come up with a unique name to avoid being rejected because another dog had the same name. The number of letters was also limited in those days. Lucy officially became Lucy Wobegon Big Paws. Lucy was the name of my classroom aide at the time. Pam liked the name and thought it fit our new puppy. I thought Bass's hounds were Wobegon, sorrowful and sad in appearance. So we included that. Since Bassets are supposed to have big paws and her father was Barnaby Bigfoot, we included big paws in her name. This was our very first puppy. We had no idea what we were getting into. Back then, the idea of some kind of pen to put the puppy in, like the exercise pins we have today, was unheard of, as was the idea of crate training a puppy. The only place in our home where we could block off space for the puppy that wasn't carpeted was our kitchen. It was a partly U-shaped kitchen with a vinyl floor. I found some cardboard boxes in our garage that I used to block the entrance off from the rest of the kitchen. It meant for us to get into that part of the kitchen, we had to step over the boxes. It was an interesting experience that we had to live with for several months. Fortunately, Lucy quickly adjusted to her potty training, so we made it through that stage fairly easily. (laughs) Well, except for the one time I didn't look to see where I was putting my foot as I stepped onto Lucy's side. Of course, there was that mess and other messes we had to clean up, but the vinyl floor was forgiving for us. This was all learning experience. The lessons we learned with Lucy really prepared us for subsequent times when we brought puppies home and when we had litters. (laughs) We learned a lot. Lucy was wonderful for us. She was a great member of our family. Except for the occasional temperament issues between Maggie and Lucy, she got along very well with the other dogs and us. That, however, was about as far as it went. 
Lucy taught us pretty quickly the importance of the written AKC standards for purebred dogs and that having AKC papers didn't guarantee that a dog was bred to that standard. We discovered that Lucy had an alarming amount of faults when we compared her to the AKC standard. I'll get into them as we go along. Her first major fault showed up when we noticed how scared Lucy was when she was around people other than the two of us. Remember the Basset Hound temperament quote from episode one. In temperament, it is mild, never sharp, or timid. Well, Lucy was beyond timid. Except for the two of us and eventually Pam's parents who occasionally cared for our dogs when we were gone, Lucy was afraid of everyone. When anyone else came to our house, Lucy ran and hid. The bed in our guest room among Pam's stuffed animals was her primary hiding space. For listeners, I'll include a photo that shows this on our website. For now, just picture E.T. hiding among the stuffed animals in the closet in the movie. It was very similar. Now, I know that some of you are going to immediately say we didn't work with Lucy or we should have sought professional help. Just hold your breath. Professional help for dogs was pretty much non-existent back then, and I can assure you we did everything we could think of to correct the problem, and my parents tried as well. Nothing any of us did help the situation. We weren't sure if this was because of Lucy's poor breeding or the fact she was taken away from her mother at such a young age. When we got Lucy, she was only 10 weeks old. From what we were able to find out later on, Lucy had been bought from a breeder in Colorado, most likely at an auction, two to three weeks prior to us buying her. That meant she was only eight weeks old at best when she was taken away from her mother and litter mates. We discovered that Lucy, like many pet store dogs at the time, had gone through two or more wholesalers prior to ending up in the pet store. These two situations were terrible for such a young puppy and must have contributed to her fearfulness. Puppies need to stay with their litter mates and mother until they're at least 10 weeks old and older if possible. 10 weeks is the absolute minimum. Unfortunately, the law in California states that puppies can be sold at eight weeks. California law makes it a misdemeanor for any person to sell one or more dogs under eight weeks of age, unless prior to any physical transfer of the dog or dogs from the seller to the purchaser, the dog or dogs are approved for sale as evidenced by written documentation from a veterinarian licensed to practice in California. Well, after Lucy had lived with us for a few weeks, we noticed black hair on top of her head was turning white. Somehow, we got the phone number of the breeder in Colorado, and I called her about this. Her response was very curt. She had no idea what I was talking about and didn't want either of us to ever call her again and quickly hung up the phone. This was an important lesson learned for future reference when we started breeding we'd be as open as possible and be there to address any concerns that the owners brought to our attention. Fortunately, the white hair went away and a few months Lucy's coloring returned to normal. The top of her head actually eventually turned brown, which is common in bassets. Very often, some or even all the black on a basset hound turns brown as they get older. Speaking of Lucy's head, this is where two or more faults according to the AKC standard appeared as she got older. Her head was very flat on top with very tight skin. The AKC standard says, the skull is well domed and dry head with tight skin are faults. Lucy's ears were also an area where she had some faults. The standard states, the ears are extremely long, low set and when drawn forward fold over the end of the nose. They are velvety in texture, hanging in loose folds with the ends curling slightly inward and a high-set flat ear is a serious fault. Lucy's ears weren't long enough, not velvety in texture like mentioned in the standard, and they were flat with no curl. In fact, they weren't any of those things that were stated in the standard. Something we were totally oblivious to when we bought Lucy was that she had an extremely wide front. 
It was more like the front of a bulldog than that of a basset hound. According to the standard, the shoulders and elbows are set close against the sides of the chest, and the shoulders are well laid back and powerful. The forelegs are short, powerful, heavy in bone, with wrinkled skin. Lucy's legs look nothing like that. Her wide, flat front, poor elbow placement, no lay back with no sternum made it difficult for Lucy to get around and also made the following fault even more pronounced. Lucy's biggest physical fault didn't start showing up until she was a little older. In the years between now and then, I'm not sure how old she was, but less than two when the issue started showing up. One of Lucy's front legs started knuckling over. A few months later, the second leg started knuckling over too. When a dog is knuckled over or carpal flexural deformity, it looks as if their wrist is giving out and falling forward over the paw as they sit or walk. This is where seeing photos of Lucy is the only way for anyone to understand how crippled she was. While she was able to get around the house and yard, it was always a struggle for Lucy. She couldn't come close to the description of movement in the Basset Hound standard. While its movement is deliberate, it is in no sense clumsy. And the Basset Hound moves in smooth, powerful, effortless manner. Put simply, Lucy was crippled. Just to clarify this condition, knuckling over has been present in Basset Hounds as far back as we have any descriptions or drawings of the dogs. Some rather famous drawings and paintings of Basset Hounds are ones that are possibly knuckled over. This is a gorgeous antique 19th century lithograph from Castle's Illustrated Book of the Dog by Vera Shaw, printed in 1881. The litho is titled Basset Hounds, the property of Mr. George Cruel. All three of these dogs are very important to the history of our breed. I'll zoom in to show the front leg of the closest dog Fino de Paris, a very famous Basset Hound that was used a lot in breeding in the early days. Many Basset Hound experts agree that he may have been knuckled over based on this lithograph. Knuckling over can actually cripple a dog as we saw in our Lucy. That's why knuckling over is a disqualification fault in the AKC standard for Basset Hounds. The goal of the disqualification is to eliminate it from the breed. Things like this are why proving breeding stock by showing is important. Having said that, I don't remember seeing photos of a Basset Hound that was knuckled over as badly as Lucy. For those of you who always research things on the internet, knuckling over is not what's called knuckling. It's a totally different condition that's often a neurological or dietary in origin. Knuckling over like Lucy had is an inherited condition. Now as to the big paws part of Lucy's name. She never lived up to that. Actually, her paws were very small for a Basset Hound, thus another major fault according to the Basset Hound standard, which says the paw is massive, very heavy with tough, heavy pads. Lucy had other faults too, but I think you have the idea. But I digress. In spite of her faults and issues, Lucy lived a wonderful life as part of our family. She loved to play with Ruffy and Maggie. The three of them spent a lot of time out on our dog run as well as in the house, hanging out together. By the way, you may have noticed that Lucy could often be found on our sofa. She loved being on the sofa. I think it provided her some security. She was a great companion that loved cuddling with us and Pam's parents. We were her protection from the rest of the world, the only humans she trusted. We all did the best we could to give Lucy a good life. We lost Lucy fairly early, age nine as I recall, to cancer. One day Lucy couldn't seem to keep her food down. A visit to the vet the next day confirmed that she had stomach cancer. Since Lucy was already suffering from cancer, we asked the vet to put her down. That day and decision are still vivid in my mind. It was the first for me. It was a tough decision to make, but we did what was best for Lucy. I've included some photos that I have of Lucy in the show notes on our website. 
If you look at them, you'll have a better idea of what the issues were, especially the wide front and the knuckling over that she had. Unfortunately, that was before digital cameras, and I didn't take a lot of photos. I do have some prints, but you can see, those of you that are watching the video version, that they're not all that clear. Oh, and yes, our kennel name and the name of the podcast harken back to the Wobegon in Lucy's name. I've already covered some of the information on history of the breed and the AKC standard in Lucy's story, so I thought I'd do something different this time. I'll just combine some historical information with my standard myths segment. Something very common these days is for internet breeders to use the term European Bassets in an attempt to make their Bassets sound superior to others. This simply isn't true. If you compare the Kennel Club FCI standard to the AKC standard, you'll find a lot of similarities. In fact, breeders from all over the world, no matter which standard they use, exchange dogs to widen their gene pools. We also have judges come to the United States from all over the world to judge our dogs. The first Bassets in the United States came from England. Bassets imported from the United States by breeders in England were actually credited for reviving the breed after inbreeding had almost devastated the breed there. I'll cover all of this in more depth when I get to that period of Basset Hound history. The exchange of dogs between reputable, responsible breeders continues to current times. In fact, the mother of our Emmy that we're currently showing came to the United States from Russia. She's an AKC grand champion now. One of Emmy's grandfathers on her mother's side was bred in the United States and was sold to a breeder in Hungary. Emmy's father was bred in Europe, but he has some American-bred dogs in his pedigree as well. Pedigrees are very important to the breeding of purebred dogs. The ancestry of any registered purebred dog can be traced back to the beginnings of the breed, or at least as far back as the breed was registered. There are kennel clubs similar to the AKC in most countries. They keep records of all the breedings of the dogs in their registries. More will be said on these topics in later episodes. Now, before I go on, let me clarify that there are some outstanding breeders and basset hounds in Europe, as well as many other locations worldwide. In my opinion, no one area is home for superior basset hounds. Many breeders from all over the world are contributing to the gene pool for our breed, which is something that continues to strengthen and improve Basset Hounds everywhere. Now for some AKC news. 2023 marks AKC Good Dog Helpline's 10th anniversary. The AKC Good Dog Helpline is a live telephone service that offers individualized training and advice for all dog owners. The training ranges from puppies to senior dogs that are exhibiting new unwanted behaviors. With an AKC Good Dog Helpline subscription, owners get instant access to a team of trainers available seven days a week for all training questions. Additionally, AKC Good Dog Helpline has recently released video training consultations. This is where dog owners can schedule 20 minutes of live one-on-one -on -one virtual assistance. <laughs> Wow, that such a service would have been great back when we had Lucy. I have no idea what the service costs nor the qualifications of the trainers. Since it's offered by the AKC and it's lasted for 10 years, speaks well for the program. For more information, you can look on the services section of the AKC website. It's a good example of AKC's dedication to help all dog owners. Now, for those of you who get a puppy from a reputable, responsible breeder, such help should be readily available from the breeder. Pam and I were always available to help those who had our puppies. They had our phone number and our email address. Now, in something totally different, regarding the AKC, I referred to them back when I was talking about Lucy's registration and the fact that registration doesn't guarantee mentally and physically sound puppy or dog. 
It just means the sire, the father, Dom, mother, are AKC registered. The paperwork is meaningless unless the breeder is committed to maintaining and improving the breed by following the AKC standard for the breed and they implement good breeding practices. Just because the sire and dom are bassets doesn't mean the puppy is going to be a good basset. Just think about our experience with Lucy. The AKC is in a conglomeration of breed-specific parent clubs and their overseer. Each breed has its national breed-specific club, such as the BHCA or Basset Hound Club of America, which is its own entity. It's separate. National breed clubs are the heartbeat for their breed. They write the AKC standard for the breed and are advocates within the AKC for their breed. The national clubs also research health issues that are particular to their breed and make health testing and implementation suggestions or even requirements for breeders to follow. The AKC, in turn, maintains what are called stud books, in which all the breedings of registered dogs are recorded. This means when you obtain an AKC-registered dog, you can also know all of the ancestors for that particular dog. So some of you may be wondering, when were the first Basset Hounds registered by the AKC here in the United States? Basset Hounds were first registered in Volume 3 of the AKC Stud Book. It included all the dogs registered in January through December of 1885. This is the index for that stud book. It shows that Diane, registered number 1988, is found on page 18. This is the information for Diane. It shows that the sire was numerous. Numerous was registration number 870. Since he was imported, there's no information of his wealth. There is some information on some wins at dog shows. He was included in volume 3 of the stud book. Numerous was one of the first Basset Hounds to be imported into the United States. He was the first Basset Hound to be shown at the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show in New York in 1883. He was registered by the AKC in 1885. Since that time, all of the breedings of Basset Hounds that are registered by the AKC have been recorded in stud books. Pedigrees for any AKC-registered dog may be purchased from the AKC. They include several generations. These pedigrees include any AKC titles any of the dogs in the pedigree has earned, plus they also have some health test results. Now, before you start complaining about the cost of purchasing a pedigree, a good, reputable, responsible breeder should offer an unofficial copy of the dog's pedigree with the purchase of a puppy and show proof of any health testing on the sire and dom. In fact, you should be able to see a pedigree of the puppy plus any health test results at your first visit to the breeder's home if it isn't on the breeder's website or included in an email. You shouldn't have to pay any extra money for AKC registration papers or printed pedigree. It's only when you want or need an official pedigree that you need to purchase one from the AKC. Any breeder should be able to explain the significance of the dogs and the puppy's pedigree. Of special importance is why they selected a specific male to breed to their female. I'll get into this more in future episodes. Since I've mentioned how important pedigrees are, especially in preventing inherited traits, I thought I'd talk about a recently discovered inherited disease in Basset Hounds. This disease is called Lephora. It manifests itself in seizures starting around ages 5 to 7 and eventually develops into a form of epilepsy. While the disease was first discovered in Basset Hounds very recently in Europe, Further research has shown that it's also present in American-bred Basset Hounds. From recent research conducted by the Basset Hound Club of America's Health and Research Committee and other researchers, we can truly say that Lafora has been in the breed for a long time, but it's never been known to veterinarians or breeders until recently. Fortunately, a gene mutation that causes Lafora has been recognized and a genetic test for its presence has been created. 
At first, the test was only available from two laboratories in Europe, but now thanks to the support of the Basset Hound Club of America and the BHCA Foundation, we have a laboratory in the United States that tests for the disease. If you want to know more about Lafora, I'd suggest that you visit the website of the Basset Hound Club of America and go to the Health and Research page. That page is updated as soon as the webmaster receives new information. As I mentioned in episode one, the BHCA webmaster is working to improve how the information is presented on the website to make it easier to understand and welcoming to guests. This disease, since it's inherited, is of concern to all Basset Hound owners. Because we now have a genetic test, reputable and responsible breeders can and should test their breeding stock to make sure they aren't passing it along. In order for a dog to be considered affected, meaning there's a possibility of Lafora affecting the dog and possibly becoming epileptic, both the sire and the dom must either be determined to be affected or a carrier of the gene. This kind of testing is something that sets breeders apart from the rest. Lafora can be completely eliminated only if those who breed Bassets test their Bassets and breed responsibly. Those who get puppies also can help. They need to insist on seeing the actual test results from the sire and dom, not just accept some kind of statement from the breeder. Of course, if you ever plan to breed your Basset, it's important to have the dogs tested. Even if you're not planning to breed, you can have your Basset tested. This will add to additional information to the database for Lafora and hopefully give you some relief that your Basset isn't affected. Those who have Basset hounds that test affected for the disease can take steps to mitigate symptoms if they appear. But there's also evidence that suggests that not all dogs that test effective actually develop the disease. In fact, some recent research seems to indicate that the chance of an affected Basset hound actually becoming epileptic are rather small. Clearly, more research is necessary and the Basset Hound Club of America and others continue to assist with that research. Another genetic disease in Basset Hounds is glaucoma, but even after extensive research, a genetic test has only been developed for one type, but that's a subject for a future podcast. For now, check the BHCA website for more testing information. I mentioned in episode zero of the podcast that some of the things you read on the internet aren't true. Recently, I was researching information on the Westminster Kennel Club dog show that was held during May this year in New York City. While conducting my research, I found some information about judges and professional handlers that I think is detrimental to the public's understanding of dog shows. The information stated that judges and professional handlers earn salaries. This gives the false impression that judges and handlers work for the AKC or some company. Nothing could be further from the truth. AKC licensed judges and professional handlers are independent agents or contractors. While they do make money, the money that handlers and judges make is not salary based. Handlers charge fees for showing dogs. In addition, they make money training dogs, housing dogs, transportation costs, plus any other expenses involved in showing dogs in AKC events and caring for the dogs. Judges are paid by the clubs who sponsor the shows they judge at. The amount differs with each show, but often is related to the number of dogs they judge. Often judges also receive compensation for travel, meals, and lodging expenses. This is obviously an example of poor reporting. Unfortunately, articles like this have become rampant on the internet. As I mentioned in episode zero, as publishers use artificial intelligence more to write their articles, this kind of information is going to spread. This is one reason I've started this podcast. But now even some podcasts are created by AI, including all the speaking parts. <laughs> no, that won't happen here. 
I am not a robot. <laughs> In case you're wondering, not all dogs at dog shows are exhibited by professional handlers. Pam and I, for example, handle our own dogs. Neither of us, though we've helped our friends by showing their dogs, has received any compensation for showing dogs. We're what the AKC refers to as owner handlers. Showing dogs is one of the few sports where professionals and amateurs like owner handlers participate together on a regular basis. Unlike sports like golf, where there's a separation between amateurs and professionals when competing, in the dog show ring, every, everybody's in there together. We're all competing together against each other. Pam and I often compete directly with professional handlers, both at the breed and group levels. Fortunately, the AKC has offered special awards for those of us who show our own dogs. At some shows, we can now earn what's referred to as best of breed owner handled, and then go on to owner handled group judging, where we can earn group placements, all without having to compete against those who receive some kind of compensation for handling dogs at dog shows. It's too bad that it took so long for AKC to include this national owner handled series competition. We wish it was available at all shows. Now, if you're a true lover of Basset Hounds or any other breed, I encourage you to find the closest breed rescue and check them out to see if they're actually rescuing dogs. If they are, please consider helping them out with your time and or money. You'll be glad you did. In a future episode, I'll include some information on how to determine if a Basset Hound rescue organization is legitimate. Yes, there are some that don't rescue dogs. Others are fronts for puppy mills, and some are actually rather large businesses. There are even rescues run by scammers. I'm amazed at what some people are able to do using the Internet today, and people fall for them. For now, the Basset Hound Club of America has a list of BHCA-recognized Basset Hound rescue groups. They are listed on their website, basset-bhca.org. They also have some good information regarding Basset Hound Rescue and their views on what constitutes a reputable rescue group. Check it out. The website also has lists of breeders listed by state that are members of the Basset Hound Club of America. You might want to check those out, too, whenever you're in the market for a puppy. I didn't receive any questions for this episode, so I picked out some from the Internet that I felt fit in this episode. Question one, is there different kinds of Basset Hounds? My newbie is six months old and doesn't seem to have the wrinkles others have. Very little info was given about her. She was in a pet store at five and a half months old. The other puppies were three months old. I knew she needed a home. Her paperwork reads, and I've removed the kennel name here so that I don't have any problems with that. This is far away from her new home. I reached out to the breeder with no response. She is perfect no matter what her genetics are, just curious. First of all, I did research the breeder. While on their website they claimed they're living in a farm that's been in the family for many years, there's no specific information about the breeder. Not even the full name is provided, their breeding stock, nor their experience with the breeds they sell. Speaking of selling, like many these days, they list prices as adoption fees. That's become a ploy to make it sound more acceptable than buying a dog. I have news for you. Breeders sell dogs. Rescue groups are where people adopt them. They also show just a few photos of dogs they claim they've sold, along with a brief positive comment from the alleged buyer. They also have a Facebook page, and it includes less information than the website, but there are more photos. Still, none of them establish their breeding stock. Some of these uh, photos appear on Instagram as well. Now is to answer your question. First of all, enjoy your puppy. 
you're taking the right approach, just like we did when we got Lucy. We enjoyed having her as part of our family, and that's what's important. As for the genetics, just based on what I can see and read on the breeder's website, they have no clue that there's a standard for the breed. Now, I need to be very careful here what I say, but that I'm sure of. Based on what's included on their website, I doubt that the breeder does any genetic health testing, and I've mentioned how important that is. Most people, including many who breed dogs, think if you breed a Basset Hound to another Basset Hound, you're going to get a good Basset Hound. Well, it all depends on the quality of the dogs being bred. Personally, I think this is even more true in Basset Hounds than it is in other breeds. As someone who's been involved with the breed as long as I have, I can say I've seen many poor examples of what are supposed to be purebred Bassets. Again, just enjoy having your wonderful dog. If in the future you become interested in getting a better example of the breed, please research any breeders you're considering for a puppy. Question two. Okay, there are American and European Bassets. Now my question is, do American ones have longer legs? Our Willie has longer legs than my girl who is a mixed Basset and bird dog who has very short legs. Like everyone states, no matter, we love him anyhow. <laughs> First of all, I covered most of this question earlier in this episode. What I didn't include was the question you raised about longer legs and one or the other. Let's start by looking at what the standards say. According to the AKC standard, under size, the height should not exceed 14 inches. Height over 15 inches at the highest point of the shoulder blades is a disqualification. The FCI standard states size 33 to 38 centimeters, which is 13 to 15 inches. So, so based on the standards alone, European Basset Hounds could be taller than American bred Bassets because the FCI standard doesn't disqualify Bassets that are over 15 inches. Obviously, height isn't the only factor of the length of leg. So we need to look further. Again, going back to the standards. And the FCI standard says under the section called body, there should be adequate clearance between the lowest part of the chest and the ground to allow the hound to move freely over all types of terrain. The AKC standard states under four quarters, the distance from the deepest part of the chest to the ground, while it must be adequate to allow free movement when working in the field, is not to be more than one third of the total height at the withers of an adult Basset. So to answer your question, American Basset Hounds could possibly have longer legs based on the fact that the AKC standard provides a specific proportion of the space between the ground and chest, something the SCI standard lacks. In the general appearance section of the AKC standard, it states, it's a short-legged dog. The FCI standard says in their general appearance section, short-legged hound. Obviously, both standards agree on this fact. Of course, one's definition of short may differ from that of someone else, but, you know, how short is short? In reality, neither European or American Basset Hounds should have long legs. If they do, they just don't match the standard. But it all depends on the breeding. Choice of sire and dom plus all the Bassets in their pedigrees. Some Basset Hounds in, from both regions may end up with longer legs, especially if the breeder isn't careful of their breeding stock or their breeding stock doesn't match the standard. It all boils down to the decisions made by the breeder not where the Basset was bred. Now, I'd like all of you to please remember to ask some questions. I had to go to the internet to find these. I'd rather be answering your questions. There's a specific page set up on our website just for this purpose. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. The quote for this month's podcast is attributed to Charles Schultz. Happiness is a warm puppy. I can certainly say that when Pam and I got Lucy, 
we really experienced that, and we experienced it every time we had a litter of puppies. While having a puppy in your home is a lot of work, I highly suggest it for all of you someday. If you're watching on YouTube, please like this video by giving it a thumbs up. Those who are listening elsewhere, please leave a high ranking on the site that you use to listen to the podcast. Both will help immensely, and I greatly appreciate your support. <laughs> and obviously, we need to pause this while the uh, howling chorus is in the background. Pam just left the building, and this is what I get when she does. Now that the Howl Fest is over, I can go back and repeat what I just said. If you're watching on YouTube, please like this video by giving it that thumbs up. Those who are listening elsewhere, please leave a high rating on the site that you use to listen to podcasts. Both will help immensely, and I greatly appreciate your support. In the next episode of Wobegon, the Basset Hound podcast, I'll talk about how we found a reputable, responsible breeder, the origins of Bassets, and the beginning of dog shows, plus more. Thank you all very much for listening. We'll be gone the Basset Hound podcast is published in visual form on YouTube the first Monday of every month. A full-length audio version of each episode is published one week later wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out our Wobegon Bassett's website for show notes including photos from every episode. You can also find links to the podcast plus information on Don and his wife Pam plus their Bassett Hounds. Wobegon the Bassett Hound podcast is produced, researched and hosted by Don Bullock. The music is Do Your Ears Hang Low played by Nasrality from the Philippines. It's available royalty free on Pixabay. Please give this podcast a thumbs up on YouTube and a high rating wherever you listen to podcasts. Until next time, this is Don. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>